Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Andrew Townsend. I'm the Campaign Marketing Manager here at eLearning Brothers. Today, we're going to be talking about how to design for skill transfer. This is going to be a great session. We will post a copy of this on our blog at blog.elearningbrothers.com. Um, and we will also send a copy of this session out to everybody who is registered. So if you have to step out or you'd like to share this with others, you can do so. We'll try to get that out later today. If you have questions during the webinar, we will be ready to answer questions using the questions panel there as a part of the GoToWebinar control panel. Looks like some of you have already found that. Thank you for joining us. We're, we're happy that you found that and are, uh, are excited just like us. All right, so we have a fantastic presenter today. We've got Monica Newell, one of our wonderful instructional designers. Uh, some of you may have heard Monica speak before. She's done several webinars, and they're always great. We're very excited for what you have to share, Monica. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Well, hello. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I've been writing and designing curriculum for over 12 years and have always been focused on the connection between learner engagement and knowledge retention. Um, I found that web-based training offers some great opportunities to explore engagement through a focus on relevance. Um, but before we dive in, I'd like to start by getting a sense of how this audience uses e-learning. Uh, based on either your experience as a learner or as someone tasked with designing training, how do you most often see e-learning used? Is it to provide information such as company terminology and policies? Maybe your e-learning experiences are more about teaching skills? Or maybe you see a lot of courses focused on the application of skills. Um, go ahead and select all the ones that you see frequently and feel free to use the chat area to add any other uses that don't fit these categories. And you can click directly on the screen. So uh, go ahead and, and do so. We'll give you guys a couple seconds to think about which one you or your organization fall into or which ones you or your organization fall into. Okay, I'll give about five more seconds. Two, one. Okay, and here's those results. So again, this isn't going to add up to 100 because this is multiple select, but 78% said to provide information, 78% said to teach a skill, and 34% said to apply a skill. So we're definitely providing information and, and teaching skills. All right, thank you. Um, so, you know, based on your responses, uh, we're definitely seeing all of the skills used, but some more than others. Um, thank you very much for your responses. I think uh, this spread is fairly common, and I want to start with that question because I think we can all see how effective e-learning would attempt to do all of those things um, with the ultimate goal of having learners be able to transfer that information um, to skills they received in the course um, and then transfer it to information and um, that they can use on the job and apply what they've learned in a way that improves their performance. Uh, we consider this goal skill transfer. And we might think of it as the cognitive equivalent of spinning multiple plates uh, at once. Um, in the workplace, situations are complicated by environment, uh, people, nuance, and so the employee has to be aware of all of these things and take into account what was learned in the course to effectively perform a task or make a complex decision. So this is what makes skill transfer so tricky. And it's also why many disagree when people try to simplify learning into a simple hierarchy, uh, kind of like Russell Lincoln Ackoff's hierarchy. But for the sake of today's discussion, I think it might be helpful to start here when thinking about knowledge acquisition. So Akoff created this hierarchy in which he believed on average about 40% of the human mind consists of data, 30% information, 20% knowledge, 10% understanding, and virtually no wisdom. Um, as you can see, he was uh, a little bit of a cynic. Um, maybe his former experience as a professor made him cynical, um, but either way, he didn't put a lot of faith in wisdom. So um, in any case, he saw data as the product of observations in which he considered useless um, until it was processed into a usable form to become information. 
um, knowledge would further refine the information by transforming it into instructions. And then Akoff considered understanding to be an ability to assess and correct errors, while wisdom was an ability to see the long-term consequences and evaluate them. Ultimately, understanding ended up being left out by those who adopted this model, um, probably because it's so similar to wisdom, and thus it became known as the Data Information Knowledge Wisdom Hierarchy, or the DIKW Hierarchy. Um, if we consider training in the context of that hierarchy, we can see ideally that combining information and knowledge should lead to a learner's ability to assess and evaluate with autonomy. Um, but this is where our pyramid gets a little messy. So as David Weinberger points out in his article, knowledge is not merely a result of filtering or algorithms. It results from a far more complex process that is uh, social, goal-driven, contextual, and culturally bound. Essentially, he makes the point that, um, well, and the important distinction, honestly, from Akoff, that acquiring knowledge is a messy process that requires motivation and contextual relevance to be successful. Okay, so if we take Akoff's hierarchy and we add a frame of reference, and we acknowledge the social, cultural, personal, and contextual factors. Now we're just seeing how messy it is to transfer knowledge when there are so many factors that affect the process. So do we, where do we turn, essentially, in an effort to create effective, relevant e-learning? I think we embrace the importance of context. Uh, today we're gonna be looking at how context promotes transfer, resulting in a more effective e-learning that trains employees to be more capable and confident about applying their skills in the workplace. Let's do another quick poll as we start thinking about types of transfer. Based on either your experience as a learner or as someone tasked with designing the training, which transfer method do you see or use most often? Perhaps teaching skills or only presenting the most relevant skills with the expectation that they will be applied to other situations? or perhaps there's a focus on memorizing information. Um, go ahead and select all the ones you see frequently and feel free to use the chat area if there are additional ones to add. Again, you can click right on the screen and let us know where you fall on this one. I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to vote. I guess it's not really voting. It says voted in the control panel, so I always say voted. I guess I should say participate. Voice I, mean, I, I guess there could be, yeah, it could be participation or, you know, identifying the, uh, what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. That could be voting. Yeah, I guess. All right. Time's up. We'll go ahead and share these. 66% skills taught in the course are identical to the workplace. 63% only the most important and relevant skills are taught. And 40% methods and tricks such as acronyms are taught for memory. Very okay, cool. So we've got quite a spread there. All right, well, thank you very much. It looks like we're seeing an assortment of methods used in trainings, um, and I think that's to be expected given the variety of goals associated with training. So now let's take a closer look at the theories that are behind those methods. The theory of identical elements asserts that transfer occurs when the skills being taught are identical to those needed on the job and placed within that context. So in this case, the training environment and workplace are very similar. So it's easier for learners to apply what they learned. This concept is also referred to as near transfer. Given the limitations of e-learning, many skills can't be taught as they would in the field, but soft skills and client interactions lend themselves fairly well to this. In this training, employees were presented with a client and given a series of possible responses through their conversation. Selecting the best responses increase their proficiency score and let them move on to the next client to experience a different conversation. Uh, the goal was to provide the learner with interactions similar to what they might experience at work and help them practice responding appropriately. So the course was managed through a custom menu 
and it showed their progress, which is a good way to build motivation. So we talked previously about um, not only relevance, but also motivation. Um, when possible, it's helpful to show learners what they have accomplished to motivate them to continue forward. Uh, in this example, we're presenting information that in a way that is relevant by showing conversations that might happen in the workplace. And we use specific feedback and a gauge to motivate the learner to select the best answer. Of course, there's going to be a lot of skills that don't translate well to e-learning. Um, but by focusing on the most important and relevant information that needs to be taught for a skill, it's possible to prepare the learner to apply their knowledge in a different environment. This is known as FAR transfer, and it relies on the ability of the learner to make connections uh, between their e-learning and the workplace experiences, which might be a little different. To support learners, um, instructional designers should identify what information is needed to teach the skills, uh, think about various applications, and then provide the learner with multiple work-related activities that require the learner to make connections through transfer. They don't have to be identical. In fact, they should be somewhat varied so that you're forcing the learner to make those connections and then make decisions based on what they're experiencing since they have to decide what they should apply and how. Uh, for example, if you're teaching employees to follow the code of conduct regarding appropriate business expenditures and gifts, you might identify and present the key elements of the policy. Have learners interact with the content. Um, here, they'd be given an item and asked to sort it into the permitted or prohibited categories in order to apply their understanding of the policy to multiple situations. And you know, these uh, specific situations could range uh, in terms of difficulty. Perhaps you have some very obvious ones, and then perhaps you have some that might take a little bit more thought and maybe are kind of in that gray area. Um, and then definitely build to more nuanced applications. So maybe an expensive bottle of wine is clearly inappropriate on paper, but what about when you're with a client and the client mentions that it's his favorite? Uh, focusing on some real world applications will help learners practice making those connections on their own. And I will say that we definitely want it to be challenging. Um, a lot of multiple choice questions end up being very obvious. And so while we don't want to try to trick our learners, we definitely want to use some situations that are somewhat nuanced as you might find in the workplace. You generally don't have individuals responding in a way that is malicious or obviously deceitful, um, but Perhaps if you have someone who is tr towing the line for the intention of trying to win over a client, now it's not malicious, but it's that uh, appropriateness in terms of the policy and the business obligation. So again, nuance is a good thing. The last theory of transfer we're going to talk about today is the cognitive theory of transfer. Uh, this one hinges on a learner's ability to recall what they learned. It promotes the importance of making material meaningful and memorable. Uh, that may involve acronyms or activities that encourage the learner to engage with material in a way that is memorable. When I think about how to make material meaningful, I immediately think about the power of pairing words with relevant imagery. I already inundated you with a lot of theory, so I won't dive into the multimedia principle, but I would like to share some observations by Ruth Clark and Richard Mayer. Um, they're the authors of e-learning and the science of instruction, which has been a super helpful reference. Um, they are adamant that instructional designers should consider how words and pictures work together to create meaning for the learner. Because when learners mentally connect words and pictures, they're engaged in meaningful learning that is more likely to support understanding as measured by transfer tests. Which makes a lot of sense because we know that the more neural connections that are made, the more likely we are to remember something. So using relevant media is a great way to accomplish this. For example, 
if I'm going to teach a novice electrician about the components of a multimeter, I, it makes a lot of sense to include an image so they can see the parts I'm talking about. Uh, this pairing words with an image makes the material more meaningful and more memorable. Additionally, I would want to look for ways to help the learner strengthen those connections. So while it's helpful to display an image of a particular setting while providing information about that setting, I can strengthen that connection by having the learner turn the dial on the image to see information for each setting. And make the connection between the setting and its meaning more memorable. Because the dial has to be turned to make that selection and the information pops up that's associated with it, again, neural connections, we're all about them. So although all we've really done is add a dial to an interaction, we're helping the learner build those connections by reinforcing the text with a graphic representation and the act of turning the dial as you would on the actual device. Then we try to reinforce those connections by presenting a potential application for the learner to recall in the field. In this case, we're asking the learner to turn the dial to the setting used to measure voltage for an AC system. So some application that could be used to build upon in an actual situation. Okay, so at this point, I can feel my instructional designers and developers wondering how they're supposed to take all of these factors into account and still meet a deadline. So let's spend some time talking about how we can design for transfer um, or design with transfer in mind and look for some examples that incorporate efficient ways to develop context in an appropriate time frame. <laughs> As we discussed previously, providing potential applications can make information more meaningful and help learners internalize it. So even though we might be presenting information very simply with a static screen or a screen with simple animation, we can design ways for the learner to apply what they just learned. But the important thing here is not that we're just asking them to recall information because recall isn't going to help them in real situations. And it's not necessarily going to help them apply it unless we force them to do so. So the application has to give them an opportunity to make connections between the information that was presented and the situation that they're being asked to evaluate. So in this instance, we presented information on what IoT involved, and now we're giving them specific descriptions of components and their functions and asking learners to determine if that would be classified as IoT. Part of the success of interactions where learners can answer incorrectly is giving specific feedback so they know where they got it wrong. And I will say that I underused this at one point um, and definitely within the mo more recent years um, have become very, very dependent on giving learners specific feedback that explains not only that their answer was wrong, but why it was wrong and why the correct answer is correct. Because I think we learn a lot from failing. And once we know why we failed and it's very clear, we're more likely to make the right choice the next time. So using specific feedback is very, very effective. So here's an example of using an acronym to present values in a way that is easy to remember. And then asking them to extend that to a specific situation. In this case, it's an awkward interaction between coworkers, where the goal is to make the conversation seem plausible. So in this interaction, we had the supposed texts. We threw in a little text sound as if the message was coming in. And then we had them scroll up on the screen. So it was kind of fun to design. Um, so we are focusing on you know, a little bit of engagement, a little bit of fun and things that employees might actually say to each other, um, which obviously I know there's a diff difficult balance to strike with that because you are trying to address the content and also keep it business appropriate and also use language that you might actually hear. So there's, there's definitely a challenge there, but you know, there's, there's a balance somewhere in the middle and I, I believe you can find it. Um, so anyways, um, 
after we've given that conversation to make it seem somewhat plausible, now we're asking the learner to select the appropriate response based on the values that they just learned. So again, we're avoiding basic recall and we're giving them an opportunity to think about how they might apply what they've learned in a real life interaction. So rather than just recalling the values, here's an example where you now have to put them into play. What do you do? This is another interaction from the same course where information was presented about growth mindset through a click to reveal. Uh, so super simple, just click on images to display information. Um, and then the learners are asked to interact with statements about um, that you might hear in the workplace. Um, they might be statements that you would make yourself or that coworkers would make or you would hear others make. Um, so we ask them to think about those uh, statements and then consider how growth uh, growth mindset would manifest um, in those statements and then ask them to sort them. Is this a growth mindset? Is this a fixed mindset? And so really evaluating things that we hear people say every day and um, might not seem like a fixed mindset, but now that we're evaluating it within that framework of what we just learned, now we're identifying it. And so again, not just saying fixed mindset is such and such, but now evaluating statements that you might hear on a regular basis, now we've got that application, now we're making that connection to, oh, this is something I have experienced or something that seems very familiar to me and that builds connection. Monica, we've got a question on that front. Sure. Do you think it's better to have good, better, best answer choices instead of clearly right and wrong? Yes, absolutely. I completely do. And I will say that I'm kind of an old school multiple choice question writer in that I usually have one that is that is wrong. I have one that is kind of wrong and then I have two that are fairly close but one is better because I think there are a lot of times where there's there's the tendency there's what you would normally do or what would seem most efficient in the situation and then there's what the course is um, trying to teach you to do or what the expectation is and usually those are super close and I try to write them that way again I don't want them to be tricky I don't want um, to to put in you know phrases and wording that kind of are cotches um, but I want the responses to be realistic enough that somebody could say well I could imagine someone saying that but this lines up better with the values so I definitely think nuance answers um, are, are much more helpful awesome thank you thanks Andrew and thanks for the question all right so um, now we're going to look at some examples of how you can provide learners with interactive opportunities to explore content in a way that provides context. So in this course about weatherization, learners clicked on icons that represented the associated content and were placed on locations of the house where the measures might be used. So you can see how words and pictures are combined to provide context. And also we're incorporating that spatial element of visualizing the house, um, visualizing where in the house this thing is happening or where it applies, and then reinforcing that with the graphic of what that thing is. So there's a lot going on visually, um, and all of that is very helpful to making those connections to where things are and how they connect. Because again, all about connections. So similarly, in this interaction, um, learners drag icons that reflect their content to the house to see information on how people who live in the home contribute to its wear and tear. So you can tell this is just a basic drag and drop. I've got icons, I'm dropping them on an image, I'm displaying information. And yet again, building connections because they have to place it in a certain location in the house and thinking about how these things are going to impact that particular location, which reinforces those connections. 
Um, also, I will say that infographics can be quick and easy. Um, you know, you have tons of resources out there for quick infographics that you can download. Uh, I know ELB Library does as well. And um, those not only might be quick to recolor and quick to fill in, um, but they are a great way to have learners explore information through click to reveals while providing context through icons and the overall shape of the infographic. I mean, you can see here, we've got little mini sliders um, that are in this infographic, uh, so changing it up a little bit. But still, you've got the overall context that we're talking about personality, and then you've got icons to reinforce that content that we're looking at. So I will say infographics are one of my go-tos, especially if I've got a lot of information that's kind of on a general topic, but it's all over the place, you know, your grab bag information. Um, it's helpful to contextualize it that way, and infographics are a great way to do that. I will also say that, especially when you have a process and you can show how something is linked to the next step, um, infographics are a great way to show that. So here we're using a slider interaction to present steps for what to do if your customer doesn't commit to buying a boat and pairing words with images to reinforce those steps. So a couple of things to call out, notice that they are in a particular order, that you have the main step um, in a larger text, darker text, different color, and then you've got the more specifics underneath, and then you've got that image to reinforce. Um, there is this tendency, and I've run into it as well, to like an image and go, well, this is really cool, this is entertaining, it would be cool to, to pop it on this page, and it kind of connects. But it ends up doing a lot of damage because it distracts the learner from the content by looking at that image if it doesn't directly correlate to the content on the slide. So while it might seem helpful or at least entertaining, I do caution against that because I think images are really powerful and using ones that make a connection to your content are super powerful um, and you want to avoid you know, that detriment of kind of drawing away from the content or not making a strong connection. That's my two cents on that. Um, so in this click to reveal, we're using icons to represent content and then pairing the information with a relevant image. Super simple. Um, icons uh, to start off the concept are usually fun because now we're starting with kind of abstract and then when they click on it and reveal the text and the image, now we're strengthening that connection by you know, taking that abs abstract concept of an icon and building on, oh, okay, well that icon represents this term and here's an actual image of it. So now I'm building my understanding of what it is and what it looks like and what it does. Okay, so those who know me well know that I never pass up an opportunity to talk about how much I love marker activities. So partly, um, I will say this is because I mostly design in Storyline and Storyline makes it really easy to add markers. Um, and so part of it is, so part of it is how easy it is to throw markers on a, a page to make an interaction. And the other is just how quick it is to design. Um, it's sort of this breath of fresh air when I'm trying to get through a project and I've cut, I stumble upon an, an area where a marker activity will work well. Excellent, I've just cut my design time down. Makes me very happy. So anyways, um, you literally need a single image and then you can throw as many markers as you need on there. And you can make those boxes as big or as small as you want. So if you've got a lot of content for one part of the graphic and you've got a little for other sections, you don't have to play that game of, okay, how do I make a standard box display that is going to have room for all of this content and then not look ridiculous when there's only a couple sentences in it from the other sections. So markers are cool because they will extend to whatever size you need for each one. So I like that a lot. Um, so anyways, I say all of that to say that if you have a graphic that shows a process or shows the components of something and you want the learner to explore those, um, it is way helpful to include that context of how the components are related or situated um, next to each other. And then asking the learners to select each of the markers 
helps them consider where that component fits into the overall mechanism. And uh, that, again, is going to provide really important context because they're exploring where it fits in, where that step happens, when it happens, and what's around it or what's related. So, I mean, think about the difference between seeing the whole process and selecting the steps in relation to one another or merely seeing a list. This is the same content. I've just left out the correlation of the image and where they might appear. Um, so you're still seeing all the steps in order, and that could be helpful. The fact that they're still in order, I, I would say, you know, sometimes you need to present information in a list form, that works. Um, but in this example, and in many, when it comes to um, describing components or a process, um, it's it's detrimental to avoid giving that larger perspective. So if you can provide imagery to show how or in which way these components are related, um, that's very helpful for knowledge acquisition. Finally, we're going to wrap up by talking about the beauty of scenarios. So because they give us an opportunity to try to recreate some of the nuance, um, scenarios are a great way to try to pull in the experiences that will factor into real world, real world situations. So you can draw in that nuance, you can create an experience for the learner, and scenarios are great at doing that. And you've got a lot of different ways um, to create those scenarios. And you know, from the more involved scenarios with characters that are interacting with each other to a simple character that is talking to the learner, it's that visual of having a character and having the dialogue um, that proves incredibly engaging and useful. So ideally, scenarios ask the learner to make judgment calls based on what they've learned. Um, in this course, fraternity brothers were asked to evaluate situations involving alcohol and the possible answers tried to recreate the internal struggle they might face. Again, you know, back to the, the better, best sort of uh, answer scenario. Um, we're trying to use language that would make sense to our fraternity brothers that not only would align with how they might think about it, but the wording in which they might think about it. So the feedback reinforced why their decision was right. Again, you know, super important to give that specific feedback. And it also gave the chance to see what might happen if they chose incorrectly when it matters. So this was provided by an alternate ending button that showed a short video involving the police. So reinforcing that visual, throwing in some video in there to kind of give that specific feedback and connect to, hey, here's the real world connection of if you make the wrong choice in this situation. So another way this course attempted to include nuance was by presenting viewpoints in the language of their brothers. So I mentioned that you know there was an attention to language early on with this course, given the audience. And so in this uh, scenario, instead of clinical statements about drugs, uh, they heard statements typical of individuals their age. So by embracing the college atmosphere and framing this choose one wrong answer as an icebreaker, um, we're framing it as something that a student might experience on campus and therefore provide context uh, and also connect this information to the student's own experiences. And then, of course, provide specific feedback. Scenarios also fit well in courses targeted to improving sales or customer service. Um, again, soft skills, anything where you can involve dialogue, you can show responses, you can gauge responses, you can give multiple experiences of how that sale might go. Um, scenarios are going to be great for that. So you can present a role playing situation in which you um, present customers and you ask the learner to select the right response. And then in your feedback, you can reinforce why their selection was correct and how it supports their professional growth. Again, telling them why is also extremely helpful. When we talk about that motivation factor and thinking about how adults need to know why they're doing something and how it's going to help them, um, that's a big part of the motivation as well. And a lot of times we try to do this up front in the course, here's why you need to know this, and that's very helpful. It provides context, 
it makes it relevant, it tells adult learners early on, hey, I'm not wasting your time, what you're going to learn is designed to help you, and this is how, and this is why it matters. Um, and then you can reinforce that again with scenarios. Look, here's how your response was good and how it's gonna help you, or here's why it was wrong and this isn't going to help you grow professionally, or how it might even negatively affect the business. Um, so you can give them that specific feedback and then prompt them to decide on what to do next in the interaction. It doesn't just have to be a single question. You could have a string of interactions and you can get, uh, you can keep it as simple or you can get as involved as you'd like with it. Um, you know, you can do a single scenario question where it's just kind of a knowledge check or you can make it more in depth and you know, if you really want to get into it, you can do branching where the right response is going to take them down one path and the wrong response is going to take them down another path. And then it can kind of just keep going. Um, I've seen some more comprehensive um, kind of like, you know, end of course assessments done that way. And if you think about it, again, it's super relevant. It is um, very appropriate for the content to have learners practice instead of just answering a multiple choice question about what should be done saying, here, you choose the dialogue and then see how it goes. And if you wanna even gamify that, then you can give them points for right answers or more points for getting the answer correct the first time. Um, you know, Add in a progress bar, add in a meter, make it a, a game. There's a lot you can do with that. So in any case, um, the goal with these scenarios is to recreate situations that have a high level of fidelity to what the learner will experience in the workplace to promote near transfer or to give learners an assortment of potential applications so they can make connections between the concepts taught in the course and their application in the workplace to promote FAR transfer. So in addition to the feedback text, it can also be useful to use the customer's expressions and body language to reinforce whether the learner selected correctly. So as I said, if you're doing that string of, uh, of scenarios, you can have the character react um, through dialogue and also, you know, the body language, that's um, incredibly relevant. And the learner's gonna pick up on that because we are very attentive to, to visual cues. And because visual cues are a part of the professional experience, um, they're used in the business workplace regularly, whether interacting with coworkers or interacting with clients. And so visual cues are very relevant and incorporating characters that give visual cues instead of just using a green box to show that it was correct or a red box to show that it's wrong. We're connecting not only the specific feedback, their dialogue in terms of a response, but also their body language to make all of those connections. And again, this is gonna promote transfer. Um, and the specific feedback is a great tool for correcting errors, um, explaining why the response that they chose perhaps was incorrect and what would be better or why it's not in line with the company policy or expectation, that sort of deal. And then you can prompt them again to decide what to do on the, um, I think I'm going the wrong way there. Okay, I'm gonna say, I thought we already covered that. Okay, so anyways, our last example for today embraces the try it approach, uh, where you give learners a similar task to what they would experience in the workplace and ask them to work through it with assistance. So in this course, the learner had to determine the number of units that could be weatherized given the budget. And you can see that there's, um, you know, asking them to do some actual calculation here. Um, you could include a calculator and ask them to interact with that. That would make it a little bit more complicated. Um, but forcing the learner to apply the steps that they're being presented in a way that is going to mimic something they might do in the workplace. Um, in another interaction in a similar course, uh, the learner had to evaluate whether a client met particular criteria for weatherization. So they were given a sample client and asked to compare the data against state regulations. Again, we're giving them the actual state regulation and then asking them to make that evaluation, similar to something that they might have to do in the workplace. And so, as I said, providing help is very important and is very useful. So when activities are particularly challenging, like um, uh, uh, 
some of the ones that we just saw where you've got statutes, you've got complicated material, you've got legal language that is somewhat confusing, you have very complicated policies that are very nuanced in how they're applied. Um, I like to include an ask a colleague feature or ask an expert um, as an option. And usually I'll just put it as a button off to the side and kind of point it out in the directions. And the beauty of this is that it allows us the benefit of challenging our learners to struggle through cognitively complex tasks and also make sure that they don't get overwhelmed or frustrated. Um, I will always remember kind of starting out as an ID and um, having uh, someone tell me that you had to make someone make someone fail early on and they had to know from the get-go that they didn't know everything about the topic. So we liked, especially for adult learners, we like including challenges where we're not necessarily presenting every element of a policy, but instead saying, hey, here's a situation and we need you to apply it or evaluate it according to this policy. Um, you know, go ahead and take a stab at it. If you need help, here's a resource. And then that's a great place to put the entire policy so that they have to open it and they have to go through it. And you can add limitations if you are required to make sure that they read it, then you can make that a setting. They can't move on until they open that. But you don't have to present every bit of that information. And I find that that's very helpful, as I said, in certain situations. And it also builds that relevance because now I'm saying, hey, you know how on the job when you don't know the answer to a question, you either have to ask someone, which is a good habit to form, um, if you are lost, or you have to know how to find the answer. So that's something that is um, helpful to build into the course because now we're saying use your resources, figure out how to use them appropriately and use them to solve this issue. Um, so again, it reinforces the idea that sometimes you need to ask someone who knows and asking for help isn't necessarily a bad thing. And yeah, so see, FAR transfer works for a whole range of things from the information itself to those skills that might not be so obvious but are very helpful in the workplace. And that's all I have for you today. Um, thank you so much for joining me uh, for this session. Are there any questions before we wrap it up? Thank you, Monica. Yes, we do have several questions here. Okay. Uh, let me pull them up here. Okay, so some of these graphics, and, and you are from the eLearning Brothers custom team, so this is not a surprising question, but some of the graphics here look very, very complex, like that house that you showed. Do you build them yourselves? And if so, what's the process for, for building such a complex um, visual uh, in, your, in your content? Okay, um, yes, so I am spoiled in that for complex graphics, I have a graphic designer that I, you know, um, talk to specifically about what I need, give an example, maybe a mock-up, and then he gives me something amazing. Um, but I will say that there are a lot of courses that don't necessarily have the budget for that or the time, and so it's more of a matter of me going through um, stock imagery because there are a lot of options out there and there is a lot available and then finding something that I can either adapt um, or alter slightly um, with my you know, somewhat Photoshop skills um, to make work for me. And then I'm just layering icons and shapes on top of it. Sure. Okay, excellent. Now when it comes to these really, really cool looking presentations, these really cool courses, um, some many people in our audience have to take 508 compliance into consideration. So there are certain interactions that we can't do, like uh, drag and drop and other things. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance adding these interactive components, making it look really, really cool with also optimizing for those with disabilities? Um, and I maybe you can speak to this from a, a custom course creation standpoint, because I know that not all of our clients require 508 compatibility. So uh, if you can talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. So I will say that um, 508 compliance is definitely doable because a lot of these interactions 
with slight alterations can just become click and reveal. So a lot of the drag and drop, although it's adding that movement, um, we can still provide context and then just turn that into a click to reveal. So for example, um, I just had a course that was fairly complex and the audience, um, we wanted to avoid anything that perhaps would be too complicated, um, so we avoided any drag and drop, so we avoided sliders. Everything was click to reveal, but we used imagery to kind of reinforce that. And so instead of having them drop things on an image, we put um, different icons on different parts of the image, so we used it that way. Um, we also provided, um, like, even if it's a tab and you're clicking on the tab and then you have the image open up with it, you're still getting that image reinforcement with the language. Um, so there are ways to provide context and I will say that imagery is, is very helpful for that. Um, and then just building different versions of click to reveals. I will say that I, uh, I'm over my time, I've developed a lot of ways to basically do a click and reveal as, in a zillion different kind of feels and experiences. Awesome, awesome. There's a, a question about narrative audio. So you mm -hmm. you showed us a couple examples where there's a couple cutout people on the screen. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's audio that comes through with that. Sometimes it's just text, sometimes you do both. Um, how useful is that narrative audio along with text? And do you lean one way or the other, especially if you don't have to uh, cons you know, worry about uh, compliance? Okay. Uh, I love narrative because I think um, reinforcing imagery, so the physical, what you're seeing, um, their expression, especially if you're doing a scenario, and their, um, their response in terms of dialogue, if you can pair the narrative of how their voice sounds when they're responding, see the words that they're saying, which will reinforce for compliance, you wanna have that text on the screen, and then also see their physical expression. If I have the opportunity, I always include all of them because I like to hear my characters. A lot of courses don't have the opportunity to have that many voices, and so I don't necessarily have that option. Instead, I will have a single voice for a narrator kind of introducing what's going on by saying, you know, look, uh, Shayla is super confused and she's struggling with the fact that John just won't complete his projects on time and she needs to find a way to talk to him. Um, can you suggest a response? And so then they'll select that response and then perhaps, you know, Shayla is going to respond with text on the screen and then the narrator can say, Oh, thank you so much for helping her. That was that was um, really a, a good call for this situation. Very, very, very cool. Um, we can continue this conversation and and things like this, like accessibility um, and the that line where you got to draw to between being accessible and being super interactive or things like that. We talk about those kind of things on the community, on the Rockstar uh, eLearning Brothers Rockstars community. That's at rockstars.elearningbrothers.com. We'll paste a link of that uh, in the chat there so you can click on that. Join our community. There's lots of things. We also talk about uh, LMSs, e-learning authoring tools, assets. Um, there's a, a large community there where you can have continued discussion right along this, this vein of, uh, of uh, discussion. Also, Monica is a part of our custom team, as I mentioned, and if you would like to chat with our custom solutions team, even to just get ideas, um, or if you just need you know, a little bit of help hitting that deadline, um, we also can jump in and take on an entire curriculum. I mean, our, our, we're very, very uh, versatile that way. So you can give us a call at 801-854-5495. You can also send an email to info at elearningbrothers.com. If you check out elearningbrothers.com, there's a plethora of information there about our custom solutions team. And I'll also post a link in the chat. If you'd like to just schedule a demo, just schedule a discussion, you can click on that and we'll just uh, you know, pick a date on a calendar and we'll, we'll connect with you and we can answer any questions that you may have uh, about our custom solutions. Monica, this has been very, very useful. There's a lot of positive uh, feedback here. Thanks for sharing your expertise. Thanks for these awesome, awesome ideas. And we'll be able to take these back and, and learn and grow. We will send a copy of this out to all of you in your emails and we'll include the links to the, um, the community as well as to the custom solutions meeting link. So thanks everybody. We hope you guys have a, a great weekend and we'll see you guys next time. All right, thanks. Thank you.